Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey, Food Junkies listeners, Clarissa here. Do we have a great episode for you today? We have Julia Ross, author of The Cravings Cure, and we have her for a double header. She'll also be our guest next week. In today's episode, Julia describes how all of her years of work came together and she introduces the concept of craving types and the amino acids that she has tested clinically to help thousands of people reduce and eliminate them with some simple supplementation. Originally, we were going to air this episode second, but Vera and Julia did such an amazing job setting the stage, we decided to release this episode first. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a comment when you're done listening. It helps grow our show, which helps us get you more incredible guests to interview. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, speaking with Julia Ross, author of the well-known books, The Diet Cure, The Mood Cure, and most recently, The Cravings Cure. Julia Ross is a psychotherapist who has worked in the mental health and addiction field for over 30 years. She is the director of the Julia Ross Virtual Clinic based out of California that treats mood, eating, and addiction problems with neuronutrient therapy and biochemical rebalancing. Did you know that your cravings for food can be different than someone else's based on your craving type? To understand why some people crave sweet and others struggle more with savory and dairy. Want to know what food plan is best for your particular type of food cravings? Today is our second talk with Julia, delving deeper into the typology of food cravings and their types with the hopes to better understand the larger picture of food addiction. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Vera. I'm glad to be with you. Okay, so our first podcast with you uh, focused on the books, the diet and mood cure books. So what was it? And, and you know, they, they were quite successful. So what prompted you to write another book called The Cravings Cure? Well, the first two books, The Diet Cure and The Mood Cure, came out in 2000 and 2003. And the 21st century has been a fast growing disaster in terms of our diet and our loss of control in terms of the foods that we're eating, the quality of the food, the lack of nutrient content, and the addictive nature of the products themselves that most people are consuming most every day worldwide now. So originally, I was thinking of a problem in the United States. Now we have an international epidemic of, I would say, food addiction, processed food addiction, and the repercussions are so horrendous, really. Um, there's hardly a word to describe the fact that at least 50% of adults are have some form of diabetes, whether it's prediabetes, diabetes 2, or increasingly diabetes 1, and all of the diseases and illness that and suffering that that causes, all of the diet-related cancers. And I'm not even talking about the weight issue because for me, that's just a consequence. You know, if I'm talking about toxic food, the fact that it causes cancer, the fact that it causes overweight, you know, they're equally disastrous. Um, but the fact is that, again, at least half of us have some form of, of uh, obesity. And most of the obesity of the three types is morbid obesity, meaning it's associated with death, early death. So this is an emergency situation. And in the diet cure, I spent 30 pages talking about food craving and the negative moods that go along with it. And the understanding that I was fortunate enough to obtain in the early 1980s about where addictive craving and associated negative moods come from biochemically. As a psychotherapist, I, like all the psychotherapists in the addiction, treatment, and eating disorders field, 
was experiencing pretty much complete failure at that time. Mm. And uh, it was only because neuroscience was able to clarify what was causing these intractable cravings and moods that we were able to move forward at all because the crack epidemic was really the worst thing that had ever happened in terms of addiction in the United States. And a hundred percent relapse rates were common in all of the programs nationwide. And so when I learned what the dynamics of uh, crack cocaine addiction were in terms of the brain chemistry specifically, it turned out that it applied to all kinds of addictions. And because food addiction is the overwhelming, most deadly, disfiguring, and associated with the most dismal mood picture, you know, I felt like it was an emergency. I had to give more than 30 pages to something that was a disaster. Yeah, you know, if I can just jump in, I, I really appreciate your acknowledging that it's a disaster almost beyond the crack cocaine or now the crystal meth disaster, which, you know, we'll see people dying more quickly. But the numbers, the morbidity, that you, you say the disfiguring nature of food addiction, I really appreciate that you're on t- in terms of the hierarchy, food is usually at the bottom, but you're saying no, it could be at the top. It's at the top, you know, in, in terms of numbers, um, all, all drug and alcohol addictions combined don't touch the, the number of uh, food related illnesses and deaths planet wise. Yeah. And uh, so it's not that I don't care about my original clients uh, suffering from, from alcohol and drug addiction, but this is where it starts. And truthfully, my alcohol and drug addicts have terrible, had terrible relapse rates partly because they couldn't eat well. In recovery, it was common, especially during the crack cocaine epidemic, for them to gain 30 pounds in 30 days Right. in recovery, trying to substitute sugar yes. for and caffeine for, for cocaine. And it didn't work, you know, so we couldn't keep them for more than, you know, a week or so until we discovered what was really causing those those terrible cravings. Okay, so uh, good. And I mean, you haven't forgotten your alcoholics and crack addicts because they're now called food addicts, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. So we're still we're still speaking to them, um, but just in the newer version. But so so you mentioned that in that book you you had devoted thirty pages to craving types. So you felt you had to expand on that. So can you can you expand on it? Tell the listener now where you went from and how like basically what are the various craving types? You actually profiled them as different, like a typology. Right, and it, it's. I think it's important to say right now that there are only five types. It's not infinite. Uh-huh. And that each one has a very concrete biochemical nutritional solution. But so where did this come from? Did I dream this up, you know, uh, one night uh, at 5 a.m., wake up with the revelation? No. In my desperation and depression and the depression of the entire addiction field, that the failure of, of our what seemed to be a glorious new model of addiction treatment I was looking around for alternatives. An alternative to 100% relapse is critically important. And I was also thinking of leading the field. You know, how could I, in conscience, Uh uh, take clients that we couldn't help? So God blessed us (laughs) with neuroscientists who had been studying addiction, among other things. You know, the, the brain is such a rich, you know, endless kind of field of study, but they were looking at some of the critical problems and seeing what what can our understanding of the brain add to what we understand about addiction. And they found the holy grail. They uncovered the fact that uh, the brain generates five different kinds of uh, pleasure enhancing, appetite regulating uh, brain chemicals, four of them called neuro, uh, neurotransmitters and one glucose regulation that allows us to turn away from toxic foods easily, yeah. as we did for most of the years, you know, over a million years prior to 1970, when we began to experiment in a rash manner, you know, a really tragic uh, error in what we were taught uh, was a critical, you know, health saving, life saving dietary change turned out to be, you know, pose the greatest danger to the human race that there's ever been. Yeah. And, you know, just for our listeners, most of us have are on par with the idea of the neurochemicals. And even to some degree, the uh, the, the hormonal piece the, that you're talking about, you know, we talk about serotonin and, and uh, dopamine and 
the stress response like cortisol. But what you've done, and this is the piece that I would really like you to flesh out, and also the insulin response, the importance of that, is you've taken those bits of knowledge that most of us, are, are, a lot of us are getting that far, but nobody's actually synthesized that into a model of, okay, this actually explains various craving types and why it is that some people are different than others, taking knowledge that we have, but actually now presenting it further. And I think that's the beauty of what your model is doing that I really hope you can uh, elaborate on. Sure. Well, let's just, you know, fast forward. The chief of the National Institute on Drug Addiction is a neuroscientist named Nora Volkow. Yes. Uh, She is uh, very clear-headed and very, very intelligent and courageous. And she has made it clear that all of the the brain-centered research on addiction concurs that food addiction is the same in terms of of brain function as any other addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the areas of malfunction in the brain that result in these overwhelming cravings really have their roots in five brain functions. So with that as our grounding, and that was the information that I got in 1986, Uh, So what can we do with that? Well, the beauty of this system that I discovered at that time was that each one of those neurotransmitters, uh, like serotonin and dopamine and GABA, our natural tranquilizer, and endorphin, Mm -hmm. our natural opiate, uh, and all of them are fed by nutrients, just like every other tissue in the body. Now, for example, muscle is... Uh, an area that's much studied and we know exactly which nutrients compose muscle and what nutrients we need if we're going to build muscle. Well, it turns out that those same kinds of nutrients are needed by the brain. In fact, the entire body is primarily built with by a collection of 20 amino acids uh-huh. in innumerable combinations. But What we're so fortunate with at this moment is that the five areas of the brain that control our appetite are each fed by a single amino acid. And so this is sort of the most basic brain biology. This was not something that the neuroscientists necessarily dreamed up. It was just known, just like we know the the nutrients that are converted into muscle tissue. We know the brain tissues, including tissues like serotonin, you know, these microscopic wonders are made out of simple nutrients. And so what they discovered in in the 80s was that, and this was a small group of the total number of neuroscientists who were studying the brain, discovered that by providing the specific amino acids that each system needed, they could reprogram the brain so that it began to give out healthy, normal, instinctual cravings for healthy food. And these same brain chemicals that are being fed by these nutrients are also producing our moods. So our appetites and our moods are controlled by five brain chemicals, and each one fed in a clear-cut way by particular nutrients. And, and, and so presumably a deficit of those nutrients would create some of these conditions that we're suffering from. That's right. That's right. And, and so when we think about, well, we're eating plenty of food, you know, why, why are we suffering such a mass major nu- nutrient deficiency states? And there's a very uh, simple answer to that. And, and that is that we have overlooked the one type of nutrient that could help us. And that nutrient is protein. So protein is the only food that contains amino acids. And amino acids are the only things that can feed these brain centers. So we're eating high carbohydrate, highly toxic, and specifically brain toxic, intoxicating (laughs) products that are targeted to these five parts of the brain. They, you know, the manufacturers know the effects of these foods on the brain to create overwhelming pleasure, which then depletes the whole system Uh and causes us to require more of the same. So it's time for us to turn towards our protein needs. And we were aware, having been working with food addiction and uh, primarily people who were active in Overeaters Anonymous at that time in the 80s, they taught us really that protein was was a food that they did not crave, that they would much prefer to eat carbs uh, and fats. And um, so that helped us to 
highlight protein in the food plans of everyone, but it really was cemented as, as an important, critical feature of recovery from food addiction when we started giving people supplements of but, the individual but, amino acids for each type. If, of- if I can interrupt you, before we get to the, the um, uh, sort of recovery piece, I'm really interested in lear- talking more about the actual craving types, like the depressed craver and the crush, like those. So if, if I'm hearing you right, the deficit, because of the foods that we're eating today, we're deficit in various amino acids, which therefore mean that we're deficit in serotonin and endorphin and GABA. And what happens when we're, when we're deficit? And why is it that George is different than Vera is different than Mary? Like, why do we have di- different deficits? Well, let's take the average food addict. You know, we've worked uh, with over 5,000 food addicts over the years since we adopted this approach, which, by the way, was an adjunct to the program we already had, which was psychotherapy, 12-step programs, family education, a very rich program. This adjunct required us to evaluate what kind of brain neurotransmitter and blood sugar deficiencies did each person have yeah and to figure out well which nutrient do they need or do they need do the, the scientists just gave them everything they gave them five different amino acids in a in a capsule but uh, we wanted to individualize and we had a PhD nutritionist on staff already she was ready to embark on this experiment and uh, so one of the great gifts of neuroscience was to identify what are the symptoms of deficiency of neurotransmitters. Yes. And so by using the the uh, definitions, we could help our clients identify which areas of the brain were deficient. And we confirmed over and over again that there were only five areas that were generating cravings, but some people had one area of deficiency. And when that deficiency was eliminated, they lost all their cravings. Mm. Whereas others had all five. And increasingly over time, since we started doing this in 1986, people are progressively more deficient. And so it's more common for people to have symptoms of all five types, sometimes very high scoring. So we score between zero and 10. Mm. Get an idea of how severe is this craving, for example, for ice cream and pizza. You know, if you've got an ice cream and pizza craver, you know, it could be, what is it? And so we'll look at the deficiency symptoms and we'll see where their scores are high. And then we will trial them on amino acids. And this is not anything terribly complicated. Basically, they open a capsule of the amino acid and put it in a little water and swish it in their mouths. And your uh, listeners can actually view our staff at uh, at our virtual clinic, interviewing several people and having them trial on camera so that they can be seen because when taken sublingually, the amino acids hit quickly and people notice the difference very quickly. Yeah. And that yeah. helps to confirm, okay, we're on the right track. The symptoms indicated that you needed these amino a- this amino acid and yeah. you're having a positive reaction. Before they start the trial, we say, what would you like to eat if Uh, You could have anything you wanted, and they typically, you know, the most common thing in in Marin County, California, uh, has been a Snickers bar. Don't ask me why, but it has everything, really, chocolate and sugar and so forth. Anyway, and then after they've trialed the amino acid, we'll ask them whether they would still like a Snickers bar. And we routinely get this sort of puzzled look because they've literally forgotten that they wanted a Snickers bar. Right, right. I, I was really struck in your book about how you, how you talk about the instantaneousness of the results. But it just just so that people know that your book, The Craving Cure, actually has a questionnaire so that you can identify where you are likely to be deficient. And can you tell us a little bit more about each of the types, like the depressed craver? Yes. What, and, and then I'll start with uh, I've got them in in a particular order, but that okay. is it's necessarily they're necessarily the most common. And you can be all of these, right? You, you don't have to be, be just one. any or all. Yeah. Okay, good. So the first type is, it's actually the most light, is generated by a deficiency in the most, in the area of the brain that's the most likely to create it, to have a deficiency develop. And that is the brain site that 
the sites that produce serotonin, which is our natural antidepressant, our natural anti-anxiety, yes. our natural insomnia relief. You know, it just is uh, an amazing, we call it the sunshine neurotransmitter because it is levels of serotonin are enhanced by sunlight, but they require a very simple feeding process. And that is the use of an amino acid called tryptophan. Okay. And so in a trial of someone who scores high in the type one depressed, anxious, sleepless craver, they will not only lose their cravings, typically for sugar and starch, but they'll also lose the negative moods. Right. Wow. So it's, it's, you can imagine what fun it is to do this with people. And uh, while we're doing it, they're learning about their own brain chemistry and how to maintain it. And so I'm assuming, I'm assuming that's called the depressed craver. That's the depressed craver. Yeah, good. So then we have uh, the second craver. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. So, But the second cra- set of cravings, brain-generated cravings, is caused by a severe blood glucose deficiency. So a lot of people are, are acquainted with the term hypoglycemic. Mm. Oh, I'm feeling hypoglycemic. I'm kind of irritable and, and I really want sugar and I'm tired and I can't focus, that kind of thing. And this is an epidemic that because people aren't eating real meals anymore, they're eating you know high carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate foods, sugars and starches that are quickly pulled out of the bloodstream by insulin because it's an overdose of sugar, which leaves especially the brain in a vulnerable position because the brain doesn't have any stored glucose. Uh The rest of the body does. And so all the neurotransmitters are impacted when there's not enough fuel to run them, to build them, to transmit them. So we have to address this low blood sugar condition. And it turns out there's an amino acid that is specifically designed to convert into sensitive amounts of glucose throughout the entire body and brain. And it's an amino acid called glutamine, Mm -hmm. uh, which has many other extraordinary properties. But this is the magic for hypoglycemic cravers. But you know that you're one if you're the if you're the person who is always searching for sweet anything. Well, it's very likely that you're the that you're doing that that you're constantly searching for not constantly because you know you get a a, a sugar high and some yeah. people it lasts for ten minutes and some people it lasts for two hours. Okay. But then the crash comes and that's why yeah. we call it the crashed craver. Right. Right. Yes. So then the third type of craver, food craver, is that one that you know, as we've been working almost exclusively with food cravers since uh, 2014, this appears to be the most common. And this is the comfort craver who is deficient in our natural pleasure enhancing, pain killing endorphins. Right. So, so is, uh, this, is this the person who seeks ice cream when they're depressed or they've just been dumped by their, their partner? Yes. And why is that? It's very interesting. You were asking me some questions um, about, well, does does each type have a different food, you know, that it's drawn to? In this case, yes, because let's throw uh, pizza in there, too, and cookies. Oh, my God, yes. Some people, yes, pizza is number one for them. Yeah, comfort food, number one. So why is that? And that's because many of us have a sensitivity to gluten-containing grains. And gluten fits into the endorphin receptors in the brain and gives us a particular kind of pleasurable high that nothing else can. The reason for the ice cream association and the cravings that that comfort cravers, you know, the satisfaction they derive from from milk products is that casein, one of the two unique proteins in milk products, also fits into the endorphin receptor in the brain. So it makes sense that pizza, which has both, yes, would be so high on the list. But it also explains why it's always ice cream and cake. You know, it's even better than one or the other. So fortunately, there is an amino acid supplement that quickly raises endorphin levels by a somewhat different mechanism, but equally quickly and blessedly, you know, for the comfort craver. So then moving now to what it is, please tell us what, <laughs> please tell us what it is. <laughs> oh, it's called D-phenylalanine. Oh, wow. So phenylalanine is a magnificent, multifaceted uh, miracle in, in the brain and body. 
And this particular form, the D form of it, there are two forms of phenylalanine. The D form is able to slow down the brain's destruction of endorphin. Oh, interesting. And some people are destroying their endorphin too too quickly. It may be a genetic thing. It may be part of the toxicity of the diet, you know, that we're experiencing. So, but uh, it, it was researched at the at Chicago Medical School, and I spoke to the researcher, and other people have, have subsequently researched it, and they were trying to reduce the amount of morphine that was being used in the hospital. You know, they had no thought of food, drugs, mood, you know, and it helped. Uh, so then, because it was a nutrient, people started experimenting with it, and eventually there was some research done, and we are the beneficiaries of this thing. It's probably the least known and least available of all of the amino acid supplements on the market, but there are three companies that produce it and but sell it. it. Might this be a reason why, this is something that I've seen in my clinical practice, that, that I mean, we were talking about how addicts often become food addicts, that my, my experience is it's the opiate users and the alcoholics that are more quickly sugar addicts, more quickly than anybody else, because there is that endorphin connection. That's oh, right. I would explain that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I just had to say that because the, I just find that such a, it's like a, tri, a triad that, um, anyway, you're explaining it very well through your typology. Well, thank you. So now we're, we're on our last, well, no, 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 we haven't. Uh, yeah. We, we have, we can't skip number four because oh. <laughs> it's probably the, the most discussed type of craving since COVID. Um, and that is the stressed craver. Uh, who is deficient in our natural tranquilizer. The brain produces a neurotransmitter called GABA, <laughs> gamma aminobutyric acid, which reduces levels of adrenaline yeah. quickly, instantly. And that reduction allows us to relax naturally without the use of popcorn, crackers, uh, whatever the, the stress munching habit is. Right. Uh, so then the amino acid that corrects it is actually GABA, which is not only a neurotransmitter, it's also the amino acid. Mm -hmm. it, it can do both. Uh, and so we can, it's very easily found and works so quickly. And it's not only mental and emotional relaxation, but actual physical relaxation, the shoulders and the neck and you know, all the parts of the body that are affected by the kind of stress we've been under. So then finally, we have what I call the fatigued craver, uh, deficient in several neurotransmitters that are very closely related, dopamine, norepinephrine being the specific targets that relate to craving. And what kind of craving does a fatigued person have? Yeah. A fatigued person wants an upper. And so that the, the big addictive uppers are chocolate, ca well, caffeine, chocolate, and for some people, just pure sugar, you know, a lifesaver, you know, just the pure sugar candy will give them a boost. Well, that would be like the gu the gummy bears and the licorice eaters versus the right. eaters. That's right. <laughs> yes. So for those people, the fatigued cravers, there is a very clear cut amino acid called tyrosine, which the brain imports and utilizes very, very quickly to raise levels of these neurotransmitters and give us a natural ability to feel focused, energized mentally and physically. Yes. And and as you said a little while ago, these are fairly instantaneous results if you get these uh these uh, sup these uh supplements. They are. Yeah. They are. Uh, it's and not only are they instantaneous, but they last yes until they're no longer needed. And why would we want to give up these miraculous uh nutrients because once we start and i mean within 24 hours of starting to take them our clients report a complete ability to go to the store and buy healthy food and enjoy eating it mm. so then we have uh, we have recommended to them that they never have a meal that doesn't include protein and preferably animal protein being, you know, the primary food of the human race, you know, up until about 20,000 years ago when we became herders and planters, you know, we herded our own animals, and but we planted food so that we'd have the carbohydrates and, yeah. and fats and so forth reliably. So that critical nutrient, it doesn't mean people shouldn't have 
whole healthy carbohydrates as tolerated, certainly vegetables. Well, before, but before we get into the food, because we're dealing with people who are addicted, or at least we are at Food Junkies Podcast as food addicts, which you can fit all of these criteria, that means a person's in deficit mode and these supplements will kind of bring their levels up. Yes, they're nutrient supplements. Yes. Specific nutrients. Apparently, the process of, of uh, identifying and creating a single nutrient supplement is fairly simple also. Okay, so 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 far, I think if I want to use your typology, I can say that somebody with food addiction has a deficit in one of these amino acids, therefore leading to a craving type. And so now we can use supplements. But let's talk about the food plan itself. You have devised two separate food plans, the herder, planter. Well, I'll let you talk about it. Okay. So, yeah. but first, let me just clarify. Okay. Um, so each person doesn't have one craving type. Each person has one to five craving yes. types. Yes. So it, it so then it helps us to understand why are some people you know satisfied with one Snickers bar and somebody else have to have five. Uh huh. You know when we talk about addiction, from my point of view, we're talking about a relative matter. You know we've got you know people addicted on on, on the same scale as as uh, an alcohol addict. So uh, that helps them to understand why am I doing this? You know. I know I'm killing myself. I'm disfiguring myself. Why can't I stop? It's not their fault. They are really being manipulated by brain chemistry that is so powerful. Yes. It has to be totally overwhelming of willpower, yeah. you know, information, so, intelligence. So, so your, your model is explaining the dynamics of food addiction, but also why we're different, why my version of food addiction is different than yours. That's right. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Absolutely. Because we're, we're always, you know, we're always going, yes, it's, there is a, a general compulsion to eat, but one person eats something differently than another. And okay, so tell us about the food plans. Okay. So what we noticed when we started using the amino acids uh, with food addicts, you know, initially we used them with crack cocaine addicts and then more alcohol and drugs. Uh -huh. And then finally we said, well, we were starting a program for food addicts. Let's just include it from the beginning. And what we learned was that they had to have a certain amount of protein three times a day and that non-animal sources were very difficult to work with and are not native to our ancient heritage, you know, which is millions of years of animal protein eating. We are animals, we are omnivores who can, we're fortunate enough to be able to survive on both animal and vegetable foods. So originally we were hunter-gatherers. It was primarily, we're primarily eating meat and whatever nuts, seeds, roots, you know, fruits, whatever was available and depending on the season and so forth. And then 20,000 years ago, we got a stable supply because we started farming animals yeah. and farming food. So that group I've, I've dubbed the uh, herder planters and they, you know, learned to adapt to more carbohydrate protein mixed foods. So uh, legumes and, and grains in addition to the animal protein, because the animals were dying out, you know, as the human population grew. So, so it is, it is possible to supplement being a vegan or a vegetarian, if we can go, go to the herder planter uh, regime that you suggested. Well, it's not possible for everyone. Okay. So some people, uh, particularly O blood types who are known to be the original oldest blood type. Okay. Do not Ooh. typically do not do well on that at all. We've just learned this over the years, uh, but type A, the second largest group, a uh, human group uh, blood type, can tolerate both animal protein and benefit from vegetable proteins. And we're, I, we're not entirely sure about the Bs and the ABs, yes. but they tend to be in areas where they're combining animal and vegetable proteins. You know, as long as people are avoiding the highly processed carbohydrates, we're fine if they choose to combine beans and whole grains with preferably with animal protein but there are people who who won't do that and what we find is that they use the supplements they can then experience what happens when they get adequate amounts of protein and then they start working harder at getting the higher protein vegetable sources and it's a lot more work and a lot more calories so if they're physically active it's better because they can tolerate all the calories you know in in vegetable legumes and, and grains and so forth. 
So uh, we give them, you know, we encourage them to choose one or the other of these plans and plenty of food. Very important that they not under eat. Major factor in relapse. Uh-huh. Uh, you again, starve the brain. Yes. You know what? I wanted to, I wanted to get to that, but, oh, but yes. just to um, uh, sort of summarize this little bit. So you've got the hunter gatherer food plant and the herder planter. And so people who are listening, that means that this is not a keto specific or a vegan specific message. It is that whatever you are, whatever fits best, find that plan that works for you. Yes? Exactly. Okay. Perfect. You really see these the, yeah. the, the nutrient supplementation of the five craving types, you know, the areas of the brain is required in order for them to make a decision about what works for them. Right yes. now they can't. They're just eating foods that don't work for them. Yes. But once yes. the uh, amino acids eliminate the cravings, then they can explore, but it's terribly important not to undereat because it's our huge yes. mistake. Yes, yes. But weight gain can only be cured by starvation. Yeah, let's talk more about that, especially okay. in the era today where people are doing fasting and intermittent fasting and one meal a day. And, and I believe that that works for some people, but not all. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you're going to be able to explain why it is that it is essential for at least some people to eat more than others. Well, let me just say, well, how, how did I learn this? I started yes. working in the eating disorders treatment field in the late 70s. You know, I didn't start my own program until the mid 80s, but it was very common knowledge then. There was a lot of research on prevention and, you know, what's causing this new epidemic of uh, bulimia and anorexia, binge eating and so forth, uh, which was, it was new. Yes, I and know. It was there with you. <laughs> corresponding to the 1970s fear of fat, which totally revolutionized the human diet in a terrible way. And I have a whole chapter on exactly what did we do that pulled the rug out from under us after millions of years of of stability and good appetite and so forth, perfect weight. So what the researchers found was that the primary cause of the eating disorders epidemic was low calorie dieting. Mm. So they may or may not have had a weight problem to begin with, but as soon as they began starving, yes, they developed these cravings or other aberrations. So, you know, a lack of appetite is another consequence of starvation. Yes. But for the overeaters and food addicts, it was clear that starvation not only increased their cravings over time, uh, low calorie dieting, but it also reduced their ability to burn calories. This is a long, well understood dynamic that when we experience uh, drought, whether we're fasting or we're starving because of food, yeah, lack yeah. of food availability, the uh, human thyroid slows down. Yeah, because it's yeah. trying to hold on to our flesh and muscles and yeah. all of our tissues. So that means that we can't, burn, you know, after a diet, we may have starved off some usually muscle and so forth, but it all comes back on because we can't burn calories as efficiently as we used to. Right. Now, was I right in, in reading somewhere in your book that you recommended somewhere between 2000 and 2500 calories a day? As, well, is that, that, uh, that a uh, minimum of 2000 for an inactive woman, yes. minimum of 2500 for an inactive man and going up from there again individually, you know, individualized, you know, tiny people with a fast yes. metabolism yes. who aren't active are going to need more. Yes. So this is not, you know, the, the last thing I want to do is to tell people exactly how many calories they have. Of course. I just want to tell them how many calories they can reduce safely, you know, um uh, and it's well, but I mean, that, that is thousand to be for yeah. most people. Uh, I think that that's actually big news for people because there's a lot of people that are like, I got to eat 1200, 1400 calories if I want to maintain my low weight. And you're saying, and I say too, no, it's, it's, it's not about that. You have to have a certain amount of calories. So I was really pleased when I saw your, uh, your willingness to stand out and say, Hey, even 2000 is okay. Or even more. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you know, when, when we have been starving and our thyroid goes down, you know, people are afraid that if they eat more, they will gain weight. And sometimes that's true. You know, the thyroid doesn't bounce back for some people. Right. And those, so, you know, when we get someone like that, who says, I buy the concept, I need to eat 2000 calories a day just to get enough protein, you know, get to real nutrients. I, you know, I get it, but I'm starting to gain weight again. And so, 
we immediately look at thyroid function. Okay. So what what temporarily reduce the amount of calories until we can do that. But most people, we have people who can't lose weight until they get their calories up. Okay. Yes. Now, what about um, 1,200 to 1,800 for years, you know? thinking yes. that's really been good, but they have this weight that never quite goes, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Yes, well, we yes. ask them to increase this particular quality of food, and all of a sudden, they go down to their ideal weight. Yeah, I, I know. It's, it's, it's an irony. But now what about um, intermittent fasting? So the people who do that properly, in my mind, are the ones that are eating enough protein. So it's not just reduced calories and not only eating once a day, but what you're eating in a day. So using your sort of dynamic here, if you eat enough protein, can you get by with just eating once a day? Well, it depends on you. Yeah, okay. So people who tend to be the type 2 hypoglycemic yes. cravers, They don't do well at all because they can't go that long without food, without going into a hypoglycemic state. Okay. And let's keep in mind that hypoglycemia kills type 1 diabetes, uh, diabetics, and people who have bariatric surgery. It's a very dangerous condition. It's very serious. We never, you know, conventional medicine never took it very seriously, but now it is. Yes. Okay. Wow. This is great. Okay. So our time is getting low and I would like you to address relapse. So how does relapse happen and what, what, what are your comments about that? Well, so the person's figured out what, what nutrients uh, they should do, what food plan, but something happens. So if they're working with us, we have them take the amino acid therapy, neurotransmitter and blood sugar deficiency questionnaire, the five part questionnaire. Yes. All in the book, folks. So and, and anyone can use that questionnaire on a weekly or monthly basis to track their symptoms. So mm-hmm. we're looking, you know, people who are mostly 10, say, the highest scoring, biggest cravers. We're looking to within eight weeks have all zeros. Wow. Within eight weeks. We're talking yeah. like two months. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that can be done. And, you know, we're specialists. So, you know, we make sure that happens by monitoring their symptoms. So we say, look. You, you really like all of these. Let's say you have all five types and you like all of the effects of the amino acids, no problems, but you find that you're still having some cravings or they're coming back. So the first thing we look at is if they're coming back intermittently, could it be during your period? Mm. Because it turns out sex hormone fluctuations affect the neurochemistry. Yes. And if that's the case, then very common time. Take, need to take some extra of the amino acids just during those days. So I would say that's the most mm-hmm. common scenario. But when people are working on their own, they don't realize that it would be fine to increase the amount they're taking if they're having symptoms. Okay. Once the symptoms are gone, they don't crave. There's no relapse. But let's say they, they've done well, they've been adjusting their aminos as needed for several months, and, it's, and they're eating really well, and it doesn't seem like they need them anymore. And they go on a vacation and forget to take them. So then they find out, sometimes they find out that they're not quite there yet with at least some of the craving types and that they need to take less, but they still need to take a few months more of whatever the amino is. It is theoretically possible, though, to take what you need and then transition to a proper food plan, either the herding planter or the hunter gather, and then not need supplements anymore or nutrients. Oh, yes. That's the most common scenario. Okay. Wow. But I just wanted to make it clear that everybody's going to fine tune themselves. It's easy, but uh, they may think, well, gosh, you know, uh, I didn't have any cravings when I was taking two of these, uh, two of this type of supplement. Why am I having cravings now? Well, we don't know, but just take a third and that will usually correct the situation. No, no, let me ask if I, if you, if you can bear with me with a few more minutes, are you okay for a couple more minutes? Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. This is just really fascinating. So if a person does the nutrients and does the food plan, do you believe it's possible that some people might be able to moderate a little bit of sugar, like on a birthday or Christmas or something like that? Or are you like a no abstain, ab- abstinence is essential? Well, it really is an individual matter. So if they've been having cravings, but are much, you know, more easily able to ignore them, but then they have an opportunity, a special occasion or whatever. Yeah. That's somebody who needs some more work because they're having the cravings anyway. Right. But when you have somebody who goes to a birthday party and doesn't really want what's there, but is embarrassed not to have it, that's somebody who 
will probably be safe having it. Okay. But if they it's not a craving that's driven them. Yeah. What? It's because it's not, not the craving. craving that drove them. Right. Them. Right. Got it. But there's somebody else who will find that they thought they were in that category, but they now they're starting to think about it after. Yes. And those people just need to pay attention that they're just sensitive and yes. they have to they have to take care of the poor brain. Uh, right. They can't mess around with it. You know, it's yes. it's very much like an opiate addict, you know, who can have a little touch of opium, you know, or yes. heroin every so often. And that's what we would call like a, a later stage food addict in our yeah. terminology. Okay, so so I guess one more question about all of this. So you, you've developed a, a typology which really explains one way to see food addiction beyond what most people have done. What's been the response in the clinical community to to your approach about food addiction or even just addiction? Has it been largely favorable? I mean, your books are very well known. I hear about your name all the time. But are there people who are going, oh, this is ridiculous? Or like, what's what's been the general well, response? Let's take different health professions. Okay. Uh, we've been thrilled to see that psychiatrists, for example, all say the same thing. Well, it's probably not going to help you, but it's not going to hurt you. Oh, there geez, you know, so we're fine with that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, that opens the door for an experiment and that's all we need. And yeah. sometimes they get intrigued by the results, but mostly they just think it's a fluke, you know. Uh, but then we, especially in the early days of working in the eating disorders field, we individual uh, eating disorders therapists would refer to us for this work and whatever else we were doing that they weren't doing, maybe a group support group, and they would do the individual or family work, whatever. And I would say about 30% of the time, after a couple of months, the client would say, you know what? I don't need therapy. <laughs> I came here to get rid of my cravings and that never happened with the therapy, but now they're gone. Yes. And look, I'm in love. I'm about to get married. Things are going really well for me. I'm happy, you know, now that I don't have these cravings. And the therapist would become enraged. And we were saying, look, we've done everything we can. We've encouraged them to stay with you. Yes. They, well, it can't hurt. You know, we're, we're in no position to judge whether they need it or not. All we know is yes. they had a biochemical deficiency and a nutrient deficiency. And, you know, we helped them with that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if there is trauma underlying whatnot, well, now they're more prepared to deal with that trauma. Like if, 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 if they if, have their their complete system back. Yes. We haven't talked about that, but the, the emotional uh, recovery that takes place, the lack of stress, over stress. Yes. The ability to handle pain. You know, so our clients who would typically, you know, go to bed with a gallon of ice cream with a loss like you were talking, you know, of a lover or whatever. Um, they, they, they suffer, but they'll contact us and say, you know, I just wanted you to know, I don't need the ice cream. Uh -huh. I can live through this. Yes. Yes. That's great. That's wonderful. I have to say, I'm so happy that you were able to uh, cover so many of our questions. Is there anything uh, that you haven't talked about that you would like us to know about your book? And then moving from that, how we can get more, how people can get in touch with you and whatnot. But first of all, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to I'm just looking at my notes to see if there's anything. Uh, oh, there is one thing. Okay. Uh, what about the downside? You know, is okay, there a downside yeah. to taking the right. side is there, effects? Is there anybody who shouldn't be doing this? Yes. Back, and we actually have identified, you know, through research and through trial and error, that there are certain conditions, for example, someone who has high blood pressure. That's probably the most common thing we get. Someone who has high blood pressure, they're typically on blood pressure medication and it's not so much of an issue, but tyrosine, which is the amino acid that feeds the energizing you know, body and mind systems, uh, will raise blood pressure if it's already abnormally high. And uh, so we ask them to work it out with their doctor, that we're going to change their diet so their blood pressure will probably go down, but they need to monitor their own blood pressure. Yeah. And we we uh, use a, a blood pressure cuff when we're trialing them to see you know how they do. But when I was working in alcoholism, they all had high blood, blood pressure from the alcohol. And we had a huge container near the front door, and it was filled with the bottles of blood pressure lowering medication that they no longer needed when they stopped drinking. Same, you know, dynamic when they stop eating toxic food. Right. So, so there are um, some things that, and also uh, occasionally there'll be an interaction with medication 
So, you know, people who are taking medication on a regular basis need to check it out with their pharmacist or uh, their physician. So we've got a, a, a little chart that they can kind of check off. Do I have any of these things? And it's rarely a problem. Occasionally, there'll be one amino they, they can't take, you know. So, for example, with high blood pressure, they don't want to go off the medication. The doctor doesn't want them to go off. So we won't give them tyrosine, but we'll give them whatever else they need. Mm-hmm. Being their, their, uh, most of their cravings disappear. So then they improve their diet and then their blood pressure goes down. Yes. They can get off the medication and then we can give them the tyrosine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, that's the, great. <laughs> the name of the clinic is the yes. Julia Ross Virtual Clinic. Okay. That's how they can get a hold of you. Yes. And the, the website is juliarosscures.com. And so it has all three of the books and all kinds of information about the clinic and about uh, trainings that I do for health professionals so that they can add this to their repertoire. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Julia. And, and people, please uh, get uh, pull out the book, get the book, The Cravings Cure. It's easily found on Amazon, very easy to read, very, very, very insightful. And I really want to emphasize that it does explain addiction beyond what most of us are talking about. We just know that a dopamine endorphins are affected, but we don't really understand how the dynamic and your, your um, uh, approach really does fill in the blanks uh, in a way that's just very enlightening. So thank you so much for giving your time today. You're welcome. It's been a really, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.